captured by the love of God. I belong to you.
change your heart and the hearts of all your descendants so that you will love him with all your heart and soul and so you may live the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Praise be to God. Amen. 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 In 1984, as we continue our summer series, Message in the Music, and uh, the new graphic for July will be coming out very soon. Uh, Stevie Wonder wrote the song that you, many of you will remember. It's the story that, uh, of a man who has a part-time lover. And it details the code they should use in order not to be discovered. They, he talks about them calling once and hanging up and letting you know, just, just finding ways to maintain a part-time alliance. Thank you, ministers at the gate. Uh, those who are in our newer age, we call it an entanglement. <laughs> Amen. Where you were involved on one level, and, and that's the one everybody sees, but then you've got another undercurrent going on somewhere else. Amen. Why do I bring that up? Why would this have anything to do with the word of God? The word of God in Deuteronomy is very clear about the fact that many of those who were those, uh, those who were Israelites, those were the children of Israel, were found to be part-time lovers. They loved God when it was convenient. They loved God when it worked in their favor. But they found ways to love other things. Anybody feeling an ouch? I do. In the 28th chapter, we learn that, this is the 30th chapter, but in the 28th chapter, we learn that it's an if and then proposition. God gives a long list of, if you do this, then I'll do that. If you do this, then I'll do that. If you do this, then I'll do that. And God is still telling us that. If you love me with your, your whole heart, I will get you. If you uh, uh, commit your ways unto me, I will give you the desires of your heart. Now, there's an awful lot of scripture that's an if and then proposition. That if we follow God's commandments, that we will be abundantly blessed. But then the other part is that if we don't, we'll be cursed. That's what Deuteronomy says. Y'all better say praise God for Jesus. Amen. <laughs> The reality is that in this life, we're going to be subject to some blessings for obedience and some cursing for disobedience. Amen. Amen. Because we are predisposed to being part-time lovers, to be God cheaters. Mm -hmm. Yet in this 30th chapter, we learn what happens after the blessing and the cursing. We learn what we experience after we have been both elevated and then leveled. After we've been praised, but then chastised. Through this process, and it's all in the process, y'all, we learn what God is willing to do to get us to the point of no longer being part-time. But one who loves him with their complete heart and soul, who can say, my life is not my own. To you I belong. I, I give myself away. Who can say that, 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 that I've been captured by your love? So, so the word for us today is that God wants all of it. You might sing I surrender all. That might work for you. Amen? But, but if we're going to say that we surrender all and that all we give, then we can't get caught in being part-timers. We, we can't allow our lives to be part-time with God. God wants it all. And so our, our subject today and our thought today is don't be a part-time lover of God. The Lord will change your heart and the heart of all your descendants so that you will love him with not some of your heart, but all of your heart and soul, so you may live. So what does that take? What does it take for us to, to stop being part-timers? What, what, what does it take for us to stop being uh, 
God cheaters? What does it take for us to stop being those who lift God up when it's important to us but ignore God when we've got it together? Well, what, is, what does it take for us to not just call on the Lord in trouble, but to know that God is with us even in the good times? What does it take for us to do that? Well, the first thing it takes is an internal transformation. I'm reminded of the relationship between Israel and God. We talked about it, obviously, in church school on, on today, that, that there's always this relationship with Israel and God where Israel is God, save me, save us, save us, take us out of this, and then they go back to doing the same thing they've been doing. <coughs> Sounds like us. God can't be God to anyone but you. Your grandmother's God won't help you unless God is God to you. It doesn't matter how many days you show up in this place. If we are doing it out of obligation or because we, we know that that's what's expected and God is not yet God to us, we are having a crisis of faith. If we are dependent on God of somebody else to be our God, we're in trouble. And that's where the part-time relationship starts. We try God because of what he's done for someone else when he wants us to have our own one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. We, we say that, that testimony is important, and it is. But the God of your testimony cannot be the God of mine. I can have hope because of your testimony, but we will never have the same testimony because who God is to me is not who God is to you. The writer also indicates that the heart will be changed, transformed. Uh, there's a word that, that I remember learning from a, a dance concert that Shelbriana was involved in, and it's a word that stuck with me. It's the word metanoia. And metanoia means, uh, is the Greek word for transformation. It is, a, it is the, the taking of what is and turning it in such a way where it is unrecognizable as what it was because it's now no longer the same. That, that's what God wants for us. And so often we pray and ask God to change our hearts. It's not God that has trouble with transformation. God is willing to do whatever it is that we ask in transforming our lives and our hearts. God is willing to take our meanness and turn it to kindness. God is willing to take our, our, our slowfulness and turn it to, to, to faithfulness. God is willing to take our part-time and make it full-time, but we got to yield to the transformation. We've become so accustomed to our part-timeness that we sometimes fail to recognize that this is not an appropriate relationship. Talking to God when we need God, not talking to God any other time, Coming to church on Sunday and not wanting to be bothered with God the rest of the week. It's an inappropriate relationship. When we think of what God has done and is and is, is, is doing in our lives or the things that we take for granted, that, that detour that you took that now you found out there was a major accident in that place where you were going to be. We take those unseen dangers and God's blessings for us for granted and we act as if God owes us something. We are not entitled because we're believers. We are blessed. We are in relationship. We have a one-on-one. -on -one. We have a we have a beeline to God because of our faith. But it does not make us entitled to not have struggle. We have to recognize when our hearts 
are really in need of change. It, there's a, another part of this scripture, and I ask you to read that whole 30th chapter, where it says he will cut away the thick calluses from our heart. That's what the message says. That he'll cut away the calluses. Anybody have some calluses? Are you willing to say you got some? Some bunions, some things like that. And you know how many layers of skin that is, right? And you know that even when you go to get a pedicure, I pray you do, that, that, that they can't get it all in one time. Because they'll injure you by taking away too much skin too quickly. But God is able to literally wipe the callus away from your heart. Well, how do we get calluses? We get calluses because we've been hurt and we just let, let, it, let it keep uh, covering over with skin because we, we have not been what we thought we should be and so we get over in this corner and we act as if we have to be by ourselves and that causes a callus on our heart because now we don't think anybody can love us. We are calloused people in need of a God in need of a God who has the power of filing it away with one swoop. How hard our hearts can become. I'm reminded of a story that, that we probably all heard. You know that, that, that story of someone who is coming to visit a church, it, it, it happens all the time, coming to visit a church and they get there before church starts and unlike some of us who get here after church starts, and that they, they walked in and they saw a seat, they sat in the seat. A few minutes after church started, someone who usually sits in that seat comes and stands next to the chair. And they look up and say yes, and they say, that's my seat. <laughs> Not only is that the product of a calloused heart, it causes a callous. Don't miss this. When the callous on our hearts gets inflicted on someone else, we in turn cause a callous on their heart. And now everybody has to ask God to file off the callus. But if this is an unbeliever, then the callus that they have has to not only be filed, but they got to come to know God in order for it to happen. And their, and their example, their reflection on who God is, is that person who stood next to them at church and said, this is my son. So we got to be careful the little things we do, the little bitty things we do. Our reflection of the calluses we have, but also we can cause a callus in the at the same time. And sometimes you, when we are doing that, and, and we've all experienced somebody who said, that's my seat. Everybody knows that that happens. Amen. But, but, but sometimes when you come with so much that's heavy on you, and you are struggling with sitting in the same place that you've always sat, and doing the same thing that you've always done. Don't you know deliverance could be on the next row? Yeah. <laughs> but you missed it because we had to do it that same way. God wants to chisel away the cow. God wants to return us to that original heart, that original heart that said, I'm captured by your love, that original heart that said, Lord, I believe, I, I want you in my life, I want you to be Lord of my life, that, that original heart that said, I decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. Where is that heart? That one that understood what it meant to really love. The one that is not reacting to pain or calculated revenge or looking for the wrong even in right situations. 
Hard hearts can't be full-time lovers because they're always looking for an angel. Amen. Amen. A reason to keep cheap. But God's internal transformation will change the hardest heart into a willing, loving, caring, accepting vessel. Not only is a changed heart one that's had internal transformation, but the text says that it extends to generations. Not only will there be an individual uh, internal transformation, it will also extend to your folk, to your children and your children's children and to their children and to all those whom you are connected with because when you've been changed, you can single-handedly bring about a desire for change in those around you. You can't do the changing. Amen. You can't do the changing. We are net casters. We don't get to fillet. The change of heart becomes a legacy of faith and devotion. God's change of one generation sets the tone for the transcendence of faith from one generation to another. Children, I know sometimes you don't want to get up and you don't want to come to church. Amen. I know you feel like it doesn't have anything to do with you. I'm giving you a moment right now. I know you feel like it, that, that everybody around you is just old and they don't get it. But that which you hear that you can keep, those songs which you learn that you keep singing, those things help you understand that faith has now come from one generation to another generation, which is you. Why? Because you were exposed to faith. Y'all got that? Amen. Amen. The blessings of God are often passed down, just as the curses are. This generational heart change is not provisional or partial. The scripture says all descendants, children, grandchildren, great-grands, see, many of us are not the changed heart, but the descendants of that heart. And we think it's us. But it wasn't us at all. It's that we're descendants of that change. We're descendants of a praying grandmother. We're descendants of an auntie that drug us to church in, in, in the summertime when we didn't want to go. We're descendants of, of, of a father, of a grandfather, of someone who walked right before God. And so we start looking for someone, ladies, to marry that, that, that looks like that. We're descendants. We are riding the coattails of a grandmother's realized prayer. That's why we must be grateful for those who paved our faith way, not just our way in our lives. I'm, I'm grateful to God for that, which I heard about, about um, uh, uh, Sister Keisha's father and his paving the way for their lives in, in, in a, very, uh, a very strong financial way. And, and that's a blessing. That's a blessing. But finances alone, won't keep us. We've got to have, we got to know that there are those who are paving the way for our faith. Because we know that our track record is not so good. Anybody know you got a track record that's not so good? I know I have one. Everybody know you got a track record that's not so good. So we must be the beneficiaries. The recipients of an inheritance of heart change that must be passed down to those who come after us. You're the recipient, now realize it so you can pass it on. We have the inheritance, but we must walk in the change. We sing, I'm not what I ought to be, and that's true. Uh, and I'm not what I used to be. We sing that, that's, that's true. But we can't live on cheap grace. We must not be part-timers. We must not, we must not really be, be, be the kind of cheaters that think we're getting away with it. We can't be part-time. We, we can't be part-cheater and part-devoted. God is not interested 
in a friends with benefits relationship with us. You'll get that later. Those of you of a certain age got it now. We must be careful about the way our lives teach those who follow us to settle for a spiritual hookup or a hangout with God without the accountability or the commitment. If that was over your head, that's okay. Somebody younger caught it, amen. So we have to have an internal transformation. We gotta know it extends to all generations. We have to also know that expectation is total submission. Not perfection, but submission. When we are fully changed, the end result, that, 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 that result should be total submission. Not the end result, but there should be a result of total submission to God with our complete heart and soul. Total submission means that we're sold out. We've heard that song sung, and some of us said, what do they mean, sold out? That's what it means. Total submission. My soul is submitted to God. The things of God take precedence. They take priority of the things of the world. When we are in total submission, we are living a life that seeks to please God in all we do. Total submission of our heart is what God requires. Yes, God wants our praise. Yes, God does. Yes, God expects our worship. Yes, God does. But the reality is, if he has our heart, these things won't be hard to do. If he has our hearts, we'll desire to praise him. We'll desire to worship him. We'll desire to do what's pleasing to him. We'll desire to treat people right. We'll desire to love our neighbor as ourselves. We'll desire to pray for our enemies. We'll desire to walk in his spirit. See, when God has our total submission, we don't have to figure it out. We have a yearning to be a person after God's heart. Total submission is not about behavior. It's about heart. James Hewitt tells a story. Says a tyrannical husband demanded that his wife conform to rigid standards of his choosing. She was to do certain things for him as wife, mother, and homemaker. In time she came to hate her husband as much as she hated his rules and regulations. Y'all be careful, rules and regulations end up being emotional abuse. Then one day, he died. Mercifully, as far as she was concerned, you know, sometimes you treat people in a way they just don't know what to do. Sometime later, she fell in love with another man that she married. She and her new husband lived on a perpetual honeymoon. Joyfully, she devoted herself to his happiness and welfare. One day, she ran across one of the sheets of do's and don'ts that her first husband had written for her. To her amazement, she found out she was doing for her second husband all the things the first husband had demanded of her, even though her new husband never once suggested them. She did them as an expression of her love for him, her gratefulness, and her desire to please him. If we're really giving God first place in our lives, it's about loving the Lord with all our hearts and our minds and our souls and our strength. We want so much in this life, but we often fail to put God first. When, when, he, when we say he's first, we say, give it honor to God who's the head of my life. We say, but our lives don't always reflect God is head. We are guilty of being part-time lovers, but we don't have to stay that way. You know why that wife could love and do those things? Because that submission was not, was not so ruled and so regulated and so, so, so demanding on her that she was able to care out of heart and not head. Yeah. Yeah. So many of us care for God out of head. We are intellectual in our Christianity. 
Yesterday, Dr. Williams said something that it, it really caught me. He said, we got to be careful that education doesn't trump our divine inspiration. Amen. Amen. That knowing so much about God places us in a place that we don't feel anything. I, I wouldn't, the old church used to say it like this, I wouldn't have a religion I couldn't feel sometimes. Amen. 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 Young adults, there's a long way something that you all want to know about whether this is truth, that you're parsing out scripture and you're parsing it out and making sense of it and finding out the history of it, and I love it because that means that you're researching the word. But don't be so caught up in what you find and what you don't find that you allow your faith to be weakened by what's absent. Trust God. That ain't here, y'all, but that was some guy just spoke. Amen. We have to stop letting life hinder our heart walk. We have to stop letting our quest for success make us like Demas. I talked about Demas a couple of weeks ago. Demas was on the road with everybody and going uh, from here and there with Paul and Barnabas and all of those people. Then Demas said, I'm tired of church. I don't want to be there. I want to go back and do the stuff the world is doing. Nah, I'm tired. And Demas left them and God for the world. We got to be careful that we're not Demas minded. That we love the world more than we love God. We have to stop allowing every little thing to set us back because we choose to be head and not heart in our dealings. We are so often like the church in Ephesus. John the Revelator wrote in Revelation 2, he said, I know your good works and that you are doing all you are doing in the church, but I have all against you because you've lost your first love. They, like us, had a relationship, but it was part-time. God wants it all. God wants our hearts and our souls. He wants our submission, and then God will do the fixing. Hymnist wrote this, is your all? On the altar of sacrifice laid your heart, not your head, but your heart, does the spirit control? You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and your soul. Then finally, there's an end result. For when we are no longer part-time, we can have a life realization and a celebration. No longer will we be part-time or heart creepers. Anybody else know what a heart creeper is? Y'all know what a creeper is. Amen. God will truly be our God. This text says when he has our whole heart and soul, then we can truly what? Live. It doesn't say anything about what we're going to receive. It doesn't say anything about prosperity. It doesn't say anything about never getting ill. It doesn't say anything about life is going to be sweet all the time. What it says is that when we give God our heart, we can live. Without transformation and submission, we merely exist. But I don't know about you, church, but I want to live. I want to live. I don't want to just survive. I want to thrive. I don't just want to be here. I want to know that I have life and more abundantly. And the only way to do that is to have a transformation and then submission. I don't want to be just spiritual dress and breath. Gentlemen, just breath and breeches. You don't want to just be spiritually here. You, we want to uh, be alive in our hearts. We talk about being a live, a live, a living church. Bishop commented on that last week. He said, you are, I, I see a living church. We got to stay a living church. Which means we can't let stuff. Give us some terminal illnesses. To live is to love and to care. Want to be alive in your heart, alive in your soul, so God can use us for his glory. 
Anybody want God to use you? Anybody want God to, 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 be, to raise up in you all that God has for you? Anybody want to be able to do it for God's glory and not for ours? In order to do that, we got to have a changed and submitted heart. Then we can truly live. Anybody want to live? Don't fool me. If you want to live, why don't you raise your hand? Do you want to live? If you truly want to live, that, that, that means that when we are submitted and changed, that we can truly live. That means we can live in abundance even when we're broke. We can live with joy even when we're in sorrow. We can live with hope even when the world seems to be falling down around us. We can live in peace even when we're in stormy situations. We can live with expectation even before it comes to fruition because our hearts are not moved by circumstances but by God. Uh, we can live with gratefulness even in difficult times. We can live in, in, in ways that out of God, even when everybody around us is turning their face away from God. And if we really are going to be changed and submitted, we can't be part-time lovers and truly live. We can't be sometime. We can't be sedity. We can't be funny acting. We can't be acting brand new with God in our commitment because God wants it all. No half step. God wants it all. No negotiations. God wants it all. Not when I get myself together. No, God wants it all. Not perfection, but submission. God wants it all. No, I don't know if I'm ready for this. Just be submitted. God wants it all. No excuses. Just with God. Don't miss that Nike. Your relationship with God. Just do it. Just do it. Don't think about it. Don't let your head mess up your heart. God wants it all to be used for his glory. Are you willing to give God all? Are you willing to be changed and to submit so that you can live. Are you willing to give God the best of your service? Are you willing to do it knowing that one day when it's all over, he'll say, servant, servant, well done. You've been faithful over a few things. Come on.
us all yeah. gave us the best he had yeah. <laughs> when he wrapped himself in human flesh yeah, 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 yeah. and came to earth as a baby yeah. not in a palace but in a manger and told us then that because I came, if you believe in me, you shall live and never die. Is this clay body gonna give out? Yep. But our spirits, our souls will never, ever transformation. God can do it suddenly. Mm -hmm. But most of the time it's a process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To go from what you were to who you can be right now right. and then to who a God would have you to be. It's a process. But you have to take the first step And the first step is to say, God, I keep messing this thing up. And I don't know how to fix it on my own. To which God will reply, now you're where I can. I can let you know that I have you. I, I keep trying to do it my way, God. But I want to do it your way. Because I know that if I do it your way, that while all my troubles may not go away, I will live. I will be changed because I'm submitted. If that's you today, if you're online, if you will say in the, the comments that I really am ready to stop being part-time with God, I want him to come into my heart I want to let Jesus in my heart. And when, when Jesus comes into your heart, even if you've professed that before, it is a new relationship. You ever started something over? God says, I'm here. Jesus says, my arms are stretched out open to receive you. And you get to do a do-over. If that's you today, will you come? you're in this building today and you know that you hear God speaking to you, will you come forward? I promise if you get up, somebody will join you. All right. Amen. Amen. 